Hello, I'm Wes Dant, and I want to welcome you to Kyoki Baptist to online worship service. Uh, if you're in the area and don't have a church home, we'd love to have you join us in person. For the address or to learn more about our staff, discipling group times, and upcoming events, just go to kyoki.org. If you'd like to support the ministry of the church financially, you can give securely on our website or use our mailing address. Pastor Steve is teaching through the book of Romans in a series called Not Adrift. Before he comes to lead us in opening our Bibles to read and learn, let's sing together.
Welcome to the online service of Kaioki Baptist Church. We are always uh, really grateful for everybody that, that comes and, and watches and participates, and we hope you do participate. We want this to be, even though you're not with the congregation, the church family physically, um, we want it to be a time of worship. And, uh, and so we hope that you will do that, be it as we've just finished uh, worshiping the Lord through song, and we will again at the end. Or as we open God's Word, and I invite you to do that, we are studying the book of Romans in a series we're calling Not Adrift. And, uh, and today's message we're, we're calling Confused or Clear, because as you, as, as you and I, we go and live our lives, sometimes things are not as clear as we want them to be. Sometimes they're not as clear as we think they are, and sometimes we're just confused. And so the Apostle Paul is going to return to really um, one of the underlying whole points of, of the three chapters that, that we're in now, chapters 9, 10, and 11. And he's writing about Israel and the fact that Israel is, has abandoned their Messiah. And uh, three times, once at the beginning of each of these three chapters, Paul really shares his heart, his desire that his fellow Jews would come to know the Lord. And he does so again as we're about to read. So let's do that. Let's read. Uh, Romans 10 will we'll be in verses 1 through 4. Brothers, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Okay, let's pray. Our Father, thank you for, um, for your word. Thank you for your son and the fact that you have provided a way for men and women, for young people to know you, to not just intellectually know you, but to experience you and to know you um, within our hearts, our souls, our minds. So I pray that that would happen. And as we study your word, that we would come to know you in, um, in even a more personal way. Open our eyes uh, that we'll see, open our ears that we'll hear, and uh, Lord, may we be changed as a result of being in your word and being in your presence and being changed by your spirit. For we pray and we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, um, again, you can see that Paul is... Um, is really deeply concerned about his fellow Jews. Jews Paul was a, uh, was a Jew by birth. He was a Jew by profession. He believed in Yahweh, the Lord God. He had in his mind, uh, for many years, he had served and he was committed. And, and he uses the, the, a word here, in the opening verses, zeal. He was, he describes himself in other places as he was zealous for God and for the things of God. Even in his persecuting the early believers, these early Christ followers, before he came to know Jesus, he was adamant that he was doing God's will. And you may recall he was, uh, on the road to Damascus to, to round up and arrest uh, those that were followers of, of Christ when the Lord confronted him and, and called him and uh, blinded him for three days. And uh, that was the huge spiritual pivot point in, in Paul's life. 
And he's looking back and he's no doubt aching for the fact that more of his countrymen, more of his fellow Jews, um, they haven't had that pivot point. They've not encountered Christ. And so, (laughs) excuse me, what I want to do in our time today is I want to, I just kind of want to exegete very briefly these four verses, look at what they're saying, acknowledging that Paul is addressing the, the disconnect between Jews of the flesh, right? What he in, in chapter nine he he makes a distinction between those that are Jews by circumcision by the flesh and those that are Jews of the promise, right? Um, and and he's he's still on that. So we're going to just pull apart what he has to say in these four verses about that. Um, but then I want, us, I want us to spend the rest of our time making a connection, not only to Jews of the, of the first century, but Jews of the 21st century, and uh, probably with, a, with a, a, a broader, a wider capture, um, people of the 21st century, whether they're Jewish or not, church people, professing followers of Jesus people, Agnostic people, irreligious people, people or followers of another religion. I think there are some truths here that we can pull out as followers of Christ in how to perceive and understand those that are not followers of Christ. So, um, as we as we look at this, I want to just he, here's what Paul is doing. He is acknowledging the the lostness of Israel, the lostness of the Jews, and and he tells us that um, in the very opening sentence that his heart's desire and his prayer to the Lord for them is that they would they would be saved, and then he proceeds to to look at four. Um, misguided efforts of the Jews that he calls them out for. So um, let's look at it. The first one he, he says, which, which is in the opening part of verse 2, he says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. He says they are, they, the, the Jews are, are a proud religious people. There is a religious pride in them. Um, they are zealous for God. Again, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, Paul could very much relate to this. For he had been zealous for God. Um, the Jews did, did not and do not worship another God. They worship the Lord God, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God who gave Moses the law on, on Sinai. The God who was uh, told David that he would, he would raise up uh, a descendant of his that would sit on his throne forever. It's that God, the God who sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, th- the Jews don't acknowledge the son of David. Um, they believe that this, when the son of David comes, that he will be unique and he will be special, and uh, some even would acknowledge that he would bear something like a Savior or a Messiah moniker. But the disconnect is he would never be God. And um, the Jews were very adamant monotheists, as are right understanding Christians. We are not polytheists. We don't believe Jesus is another God. We believe that there is one God who is found in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We believe that, and we'll look at next time because of his word, Scripture, what Scripture says. Uh, But there is a pride. There is a pride in their religion. There's a pride in their connection. There is a zeal that he's going to go on to say has, 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 has kind of gone off the tracks. Okay, so let's, let's look and see what, what the second misguided effort that he calls them out on. Um, still in verse 2, 
He says, I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge, for being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. Now let's just, let's just kind of zero in on the fact that they had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Because they were ignorant of the righteousness of God. There is a spiritual blindness. That would be the second misguided effort of the Jews. There was a spiritual blindness in them. Imagine, they, are, they have this excitement for God. They, they believed in God. They served God. Uh, they followed God's law. But they were doing it not according to his word. They were doing it not according um, to the knowledge that God had given them in his word. They were spiritually blind in the midst of their legal excitement. In the midst of their religious pride, they are spiritually unseen. And we're going to make a connection on what that looks like and how that affects people today. But they're spiritually blind. The third misguided effort uh, we read in, in the end of verse 13. They were ignorant of the right, verse 3, not 13, verse 3. Being ignorant of the righteousness of God, seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. There is a self-righteousness in the Jews that Paul says is misguided. You've, you have missed God in the midst of seeking to establish your own righteousness. Now, the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church at Rome, is a book about the righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of man. The unrighteousness of Gentiles, the unrighteousness of, Jew, of Jews. In and of ourselves, we cannot acquire, develop, um, bring ourselves, be religious enough to, to acquire the righteousness that is needed. But yet that's exactly what the Jews are leaning on and counting on. There is, it is a righteousness that is misguided, but it's not according to knowledge. Um, in fact, he calls them ignorant of this righteousness of God that is needed. Instead, they, they seek to establish their, their own righteousness. They try to be good enough. And then finally, the fourth misguided effort is an unyielding stubbornness. An unyielding stubbornness. Um, he tells us they did, in the end of verse 3, they did not submit to God's righteousness, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Um, they're willing to stand on their own. Why? Because even though earlier in Paul's letter here to the Romans, he has made it clear that we are unrighteous beings. He's saying, my, my kinsmen, the Jews, um, they don't buy that. They refuse to submit to the legal, to the, to the requirements of righteousness. And that includes acknowledging that I can never be righteous enough. That I need, we, we say this almost every time. You can go back and watch the tape. It is a point of recognizing that I need something outside of me, outside of myself, to make me righteous. Um, you need something, someone outside of you, outside of yourself, because you can never be good enough. All right, that's a, that is in our day somewhat of a foreign concept, a foreign thought. But Paul does not pull punches. And so he calls them out on that. Okay, so those are, those are, that's, a, that's just a brief look 
at what he's getting at, what he's saying to his fellow Jews. What I'd like to, what I would like to just spend the rest of our time on is, 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 is really applying this, um, drawing up out of these four verses a word for modern day Christians. So let's put this word, and there's going to be a few of them, under the umbrella of, um, of a statement that Paul makes here in verse 2. He writes, I, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. Now most of us, most living human beings in 2023 would say, if you have a zeal for God, that's enough. That's enough. It doesn't matter what your God looks like or who your God is. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Is that not a cry, a cry of the 21st century? It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere in that belief. And, and what Paul and ultimately the Lord is saying here is what you and I believe matters. What we believe matters. And so let's dig a little under the surface and let's, uh, let's explore how that looks. It matters because notice the first thing he says in verse 1 is he says he prays for, for his people. It matters. It affects how you pray, what you believe. Do you believe God hears prayer? Do you believe when you pray to God that he wants what is best for you? Do you believe that he is all-powerful and holy and righteous and sovereign and mighty and can do anything he desires to do? Is that the God that you worship? Or is your God kind of a weakling, mamby-pamby, uh, uber busy and he may or may not hear you? Why would God be concerned about you? There's all kind of understandings about God and why God does or doesn't hear you and me. Maybe your idea of God is his whole world revolves around you. And the only thing he's concerned about is you. You've got a really puffed up version of you and a very demented understanding of God. Well, you can't go through Romans 8 and Romans 9. And as Paul discusses and writes about this majestic, sovereign God who makes decisions before the foundation of the world in choosing people, you can't come away with that, a proper understanding of that, and a mamby-pamby God, or a God who is so consumed with you that what he, 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 he's not about himself. Oh, God is about himself. God is about his glory. God wants you to fall in love and to fall on your knees before his, excuse me, majestic glory. All of that, your understanding of God affects how you pray. Paul says, I pray for them. It is my heart's desire. And out of that desire of my heart, I am compelled to pray to God that they would be saved. Uh, sometimes I, I'm, I hear people ask the question, um, how do we pray for the lost? Will you pray that the lost would would be saved, that God would save them. You pray that God would open their eyes. How would you have prayed for an apostle Paul? I mean, God physically blinded him, but physical blindness was not his problem, his biggest problem. His biggest problem is he was, he was spiritually blind. That's how we pray for the lost. God, give them eyes to see, spiritual eyes to see. Would you come into their life? Would you open their darkened souls to yourself. Oh, it, our understanding of God not only compels us to pray, but it greatly affects how we pray. Okay? Next, what we believe matters because of who you live for. Because of who you live for. Um, again, in verse 2, he writes, for I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Now, we've mentioned this earlier, but it's worth repeating. Um, 
The problem with first century, the first century Jews who miss Christ is, a, is the same problem that a lot of Americans, a lot of people have in the 21st century, and I'll even go so far as to say a lot of churched people have um, in, the 20, in 2023, and that is we acknowledge the things of God, and on Sundays we're zealous for God, and we maybe have kind of set up a structure for our life that we think is pleasing God, but we don't really live for the Lord. We don't really live for God. Um, we are zealous in our own way, but not according to the truth. Not according to the truth. Um, what you believe and understand about God directly affects, do I live for myself? Do I live for other idols that I've constructed or I acknowledge in my life? Maybe it's football season started. I this and I have struggled with this. Sometimes we we can worship sports and hobbies and uh, sometimes we worship goals that we have set. Maybe the goal of being married or 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 having children or and those are good worthy goals, but if they, they can they can cross that line of becoming idols and ourselves idolaters, we worship those things and we'll do anything, even if it means cutting against um, going against the will of God as found in his word. Um, when a couple decides that, you know what, um, we want to move in together, but we don't want to bother to get married or we're going to give it a little time. Uh, and and I, in, the, in the root of my heart, I know that's wrong, that that's not what God would have me do. But because of my desire of have this person maybe become my spouse, I'll do that. I'm not living for God in that. I'm living for myself. I'm living for uh, this other person's acceptance. Who do you live for? Do you live for the Lord? Do you live for the Lord Jesus? What you believe matters. What you believe matters. It matters not only because of how we pray. It matters not only because of who we live for. But... We see in verse 4, it matters because of how we live. It matters because of how we live. Uh, he makes a just, boy, we could stay here and just kind of parse out all the consequences of what Paul says in verse 4. For Christ, not Buddha, uh, not observance of the law, not attending religious functions, not religious symbolism or sacraments that are kept, uh, but Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now think about this. If Christ is the end of the law, First of all, I, can, I, I realize I can never be good enough. If Jesus is the end of the law, the law finds its culmination. It finds its fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything about the law was moving toward Christ. The writer of Hebrews would say, the law is good and holy and of the Lord, but Jesus is better. Because Jesus is its ultimate end. Um, I can never, I realize I can never be good enough because the law says, the law says, do this, do that, obey this rule, keep that, this set of rules. And Paul says to the people that have spent generation after generation of keeping and observing that law, he says in verse 1, my heart's desire and my prayer is that they be saved. In other words, they were zealous for God, but they, they sought a righteousness that was not of God. Over six 
hundred laws to obey, and Paul says, hey, you law keepers, you need a Savior. I pray that you will come to know the Savior. It doesn't matter how religious I am, doesn't matter how educated I am, how cool I am, how financially secure I am, I need a Savior. It doesn't matter how much I adhere to the the Jewish religion, the Christian religion, the, the Hindu religion, the Buddhist religion, the Muslim religion. I need a Savior. Every person that is born needs a Savior. Because we can never be good enough in and of ourselves if Christ is the end of the law. Here's here's another ramification of Christ being the end of the law. It is that the law or religion itself never was intended to save. Listen, it's not like the law woke up one day and said, you know what, after all these hundreds of years, I don't think we can save anybody. Paul tells us in Galatians that the whole intent of the law was to teach us that we couldn't obey it, that we couldn't keep it. It, it, it was a schoolmaster. Paul, earlier in, in Romans, um, I invite you to look back, if you would, at Romans 3, verse 20. Listen to, listen to what he says. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. All right? Schoolmaster, teacher, you can't keep me. You are a sinner. All right, verse 21. But now, when we came to here, we have we referred to this as one of the great pivot points in the book of Romans. Paul has explained how we are, are not never going to be righteous enough to, uh, to be worthy of salvation because we're sinners. But verse 21 is the pivot point. But now... The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Amen, amen, and amen. If Christ is the end of the law, I can finally recognize that the law never was intended to save me or anybody else. And finally, um, if Christ is the end of the law, we must be bold and clear on declaring Jesus and compassionately seeking to understand our lost friends. Let let me say that again. If Christ is the end of the law, if he is the ultimate conclusion of all things, he is who he said he is, the only way to the Father, then as his followers, if you are a Christian, we must be bold and we must be clear on sharing him, on declaring Christ And we must be compassionate in how we see, view, and understand our lost friends. The people that we work with, family members, uh, the people maybe that you, you sit next to in church. A few years ago, George Barna did a, a survey of Americans and their understanding of, um, of salvation. And what they found was 80% of Americans believe that there is more than one way to salvation. 80%. Now here's what's even scarier. That same survey showed that 68% of American evangelicals believe that there is more than one way to be saved. 68%. Now to be fair, 
you're really not an evangelical if you believe there's more than th that Christ is not the only way to be saved. But what Barna found is people that identify, self identify as evangelicals, amongst that group, they would tell you they're evangelical. They believe, 68% believe that there's more than one way to heaven, more than one way to God, more than one way to the Father, than Christ. That He's a way. But he's not necessarily the only way. And I, and, I, and I camp out there momentarily for this reason. We need to remember that lost people are often morally good people um, who have maybe given thought to some of the things, spiritual uh, realities and spiritual truth, and, we, and, and they view themselves and often others view them as good people. And they certainly, they certainly would concur with that. However, um, if you don't know Jesus Christ, Scripture tells us that if I'm not a Christian, if I don't have the Spirit of God living in me, I am deceived about my own spiritual condition before God. I'm, I'm deceived. And that can go either way. I can be deceived thinking, huh, I don't need God. I'm a, I'm a good person. Or it could manifest itself in the sense of, I can never be saved. I have done some hideous things. God would never, would never forgive me, would never accept me, never take me into his family. I, I, I could never know God because of who I am. Both of those extremes are wrong. They're both wrong. Um, we keep going back to verse 2, but it's a powerful statement. The Jews were zealous for God, but they did not accurately perceive their need for God. Right? I mean, you can look at most... Paul could look at his his fellow Jews and, and just morally say, these are good people. Back in chapters 2 and 3, Paul, he makes the distinction between the fact that Gentiles, for the most part, were not morally good. They were morally corrupt. They lived their lives in a, in a, in a very morally vacuous way, but not so for Jews. The Jews were morally law keepers. They just didn't understand their own unrighteousness. And then, and we'll close with this, lost people, as we, as we understand how we can pray and how we can develop a, a heart and a, and a conversation with those that don't know Jesus, we need to recognize the fact that lost people think they don't need a Savior. Lost people think they don't need a Savior. That was, again, back to our passage. The Jews didn't think they needed a Savior. They kept the law. They didn't realize that they had, they had fallen prey to a righteousness that was not of God. And that, is that not our culture? Is that not your friends? Is that not your co-workers that don't know Jesus? I mean, they will gladly take Christ as friend, as a mentor, as example, as a teacher or a guide. Uh, they will consider him a religious icon, overall good guy. But what they won't do is they won't take him, acknowledge him, receive him, as the only sacrifice for sin, as their only hope for salvation and forgiveness and eternal life. The reason they won't see him that way is because for the most part, they don't see themselves as sinners. They don't see themselves in need of a signal. They don't see themselves as being that bad. They're, after all, they look at friends and people that they know and live around and they go, huh, I'm better than that guy. And they use the wrong
wrong system, the wrong measuring device to view themselves through. The Jews used the law and their adherence to it. 21st century men and women, American men and women, they view politics. I'm a Republican or I'm a Democrat. I vote for this guy. Therefore, you know, I wave the American flag. Therefore, hey, I must be saved. Um, or I go to church. I must be saved. Uh, or I give to the church. I must be saved. I'm a member of a church. I must be saved. Or I give to humanitarian causes. I must be a Christian. God certainly will receive that. When the truth of his word is until I come to the end of me and recognize that I will never be good enough, that I am a sinner in need of the one and only Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Only through him will I be saved. And friend, I want to tell you as we wrap up, that is my only hope and it's your only hope. Do you know him? Not as a good guy, not as a good teacher, not as a friend, but a savior of your soul and life. He is as close, and we'll, and we'll dig deep next week in this, but he is as close as you in faith trusting him and surrendering all of you to him. I pray that you would. Hope that you will. Let's go to him. Father, uh, God, I pray for every person that is still with us that, they would, uh, that they, would, they would see their need for Christ and Christ alone and that in the depths of their heart and soul, they would turn to you and trust you and you alone. And I pray for those that are, are yours, that have, have surrendered their lives to Christ, that, Lord, we will, we will pray and we will perceive and understand our lost friends. Even as Paul cared and loved his lost compatriots, that, Lord, there is a spiritual blindness that only you can, can take away. And we pray, God, that you will find us faithful to pray and to share and to speak the good news of Jesus Christ to those you place in our paths. For it is in Christ's name and for your glory that we pray. Amen. All right. Thanks for being with us. We're going to close out, as I mentioned earlier, through the worship of the Lord in song. And I look forward to, uh, to being together next time. God bless you.